Hey everyone. Welcome to our webinar. It's not just me. Here's our friends. Hello. <laughs> Come in closer. Okay, so uh, I'm Katie, and today we're going to talk about um, how we did crowdfunding for our school farming program. Uh, and I do have friends, they're here, I promise. <laughs> Look, there's one. There's another one. <laughs> um, so we have Callie. Hey. Um, so Callie is one of the student farmers. There we go. That's better. Right? Yeah. Oh, we're all here. Oh, we're all here. Callie's one of the student farmers. She's worked with us for two years, and she's probably going to work with us again because she's great, and then she's going to go to college because she's super great. And then uh, we also have Sivian, who does communications and social media and all kinds of wizardry. Things, yes. Of those types of things. So he's going to talk about social media and crowdfunding and we'll tell you what we did and we'll tell you about the mistakes we made and we'll tell you about the good things we did um, so that you can do them too. So there is like a Q&A feature if you want to use that or you can always um, text us or email us or tweet us your questions. So I'm going to switch over um, some slides that we prepared. So that you can see some photos. So I'm gonna do that now. Here it comes. All right. So um, our topic today is crowdfunding with School Grown. So you want to take it away? Sure. So thank you for coming. We're happy to have you guys here for this session. Um, I guess we already introduced ourselves. Um, yeah, that counts. <laughs> um, so for today, we're going to talk. Um, Callie will give you an introduction to School Grown and about how our program works. Um, and then we'll talk about crowdfunding um, and all of the sort of details and things that we learned um, when we ventured into that world. Um, and then there's also a time for a Q&A with us and Sifian if you have questions. But you can also always follow up with questions via the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the good part about the internet. Follow yeah. up afterwards and we'll get back to you. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So there you go. If you have questions, you can email them or you can tweet them. Um, and then also this is being recorded so that you can uh, share it with your friends later. Or if you need to leave at any time, you can, yourself can watch it later. So that's great. Do you want to tell us about icebreakers? So um, every summer when we have a new student, we usually do icebreakers just to get each other comfortable. Um, so we're gonna do now one now. We're gonna do the f what would you call this game? Well, we do. It's like speed dating. Yeah. So we're gonna do sp the speed dating game and ask a couple questions about food. So I'll ask the first question. Who are you asking? I ask Katie. Okay. Um. <laughs> what food? What food reminds you of your childhood? Ooh. Okay. Where I'm from in North Dakota. Uh, there's this thing called hot dish, which is basically what is, what is hot dish, right? Hot dish is a noodle, some type of noodle, some type of ground meat, and some type of sauce, and you bake it in a, as a casserole. But like families have their own hot dish recipes. Like you can have a wide variety of different types of hot dish, but like hot dish is like cheap to make, really filling. Uh, and if you were to go to like any supper in North Dakota, you would have that family's hot dish. <laughs> and is there like a, this is my best hot dish? Is yeah. There a hot dish competition? Yeah, like like people are proud of their hot dish. That's a, that's a good tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sufian, <clears throat> if you could have dinner with anybody, who would it be and what would you eat? This is so tough. Just go with it. Oh my God. These days? Uh, anybody at all. This is too hard. Too hard? There's too many, too many options of people. Okay. Do you want a different question? Sure. Okay. Um, what do you like to cook at home for yourself when you're feeling really lazy? Really lazy? Yeah. Some kind of a stew or curry. Mm. You just wing it, put it whatever you have in it, and then put some cumin in, and you got a probably tasty thing. Yum. <laughs> okay, you get to ask Callie a question. Okay, Callie. What food would you make for someone on your first date? Oh, I think we're going to ask this one. Um, oh. So 
I'd probably make something that I eat all the time. So I eat pickles a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I'd probably make pickles and then something really awkward that goes with it. I eat shrimp a lot. So I'd probably just make them pickles and shrimp. Shrimp and pickles. Yeah. There you go. Tyler likes to be her true authentic self, you know? I think that's important. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Yeah. Shrimp and pickles. Shrimp and pickles. <laughs> that's great. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, Callie's going to tell us, um, a bit about School Grown and how it works. So, School Grown is a summer program that happens every summer. Uh, Katie hires 14 students, seven students from Easto and seven students from Bendo. Uh, we get paid full-time jobs. Um, we also get two school credits if you take the co-op course, and it's a great way to make friends. So the first school we grow at is at the rooftop of Eastdale Collegiate. That's at Broadview and Girard. Um, oh, here's a picture. <laughs> this is the rooftop before there are any beds. And this is after, this is the layout. And this is how it looks now. What, there's vegetables in it. So that was when we were just installing it. And that big red hose is actually a soil blower. That a truck that went like up and over. It's almost like a reverse vacuum, and it we were able to blow the soil up onto the roof. So that's what it looks like with plants. The second school is Bendo BTI at Lawrence and Midland. So this is the front garden, and this is the back garden where we usually grow the tomatoes and zucchini, just because it's bigger and we have trellises there. Um, like I said before, we hire 14 students. Um, at first, Katie didn't have as many students, but the more summers that go by, the more she hires. And we also get the after school jobs, March break jobs, and summer jobs. We sell our produce to restaurants. Um, we also sell our produce at farmer's markets. So one of the farmer's markets are Eastland, that's uh, right near Woodbine Station. We do that every thir Thursdays from <coughs> 3 to 8, I believe. Yeah. And the other one is um, Bloor and Borden, which is near Bathurst Station. And it's on Wednesdays. So you can see we are able to grow a lot of food. This is probably like a farmer's market stand in August where there's lots of variety. Um. We also sell our produce to teachers and neighbors. This is um, one of uh, one of the students' parents coming to pick up her child. I guess she's seen the students growing the vegetables and harvesting and asked if she could have some. So we have like a veggie drive-thru yeah. <laughs> where she rolls down her window and asks what's good. <laughs> um, and then on the right, that's um, we did like a harvest share for the teachers. So the business class marketed it. They put together a sample, brought it, and showed it to all the teachers, and then teachers would sign up. And for $15, they would get $20 worth of food. So in that week, they got um, radishes, beets, carrots, tomatoes, uh, lettuce mix, and a bag of kale. So it's a pretty good deal. We also do cooking classes at uh, East Dill in their kitchen. We learn how to use the produce we're growing, learn how to cook from scratch, and also learn what each vegetable tastes like. We go on field trips. This is um, at... That one was um, Fresh City Farms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we went to the Western Food Co-op. Um, so what school grown means to me and what I've learned through school grown. So I've learned a lot of things that I never thought I would, like how to grow vegetables and how to harvest them. Um, you meet a lot of new people and a lot of friends, and also because you go to school with those people, some of them you've never talked to. So you get to learn who you're going to school with. It's a great way to get, your start, get yourself working, including if you're a high school student, because when you're younger, it's kind of harder for you to find jobs. Um, it taught me how to be more outgoing, and I also learned a lot about myself. Cool. So again, if you have questions, you can just um, email or tweet, and we'll grab them. Um, or you can just send us a follow-up. So today's topic is about crowdfunding. So this was our old van. Look how beautiful it was. But it was old. Um, it was a little junky. 
And unfortunately, it got into a car accident where everyone was okay, but the van was kind of not worth fixing. So we found ourselves um, in the springtime without a vehicle to get to the farmer's market and without a grant to pay for it um, and trying to think about how we could raise money and time for the farmer's market so that we could bring our food to the market. So what we did is we launched a crowdfunding campaign. Um, so we used the platform Indiegogo and we just wanted to see if we could get some funding from everyone who kind of follows us on Twitter, supports our work, we meet at the market. The idea is just looking at the crowd that's around you and getting people to pitch in $10 or $100 or whatever they can do um, so that you can raise the funds. And we were successful. Yay. <laughs> um, so we bought that van that's in the picture behind. It's a used van. It's a Ford Transit, which is really good for uh, farmy type jobs because it's um, short and easy to drive in the city and park, but it's also tall, so you can stack bins. Um, and it also has seats for people, so it's a really good um, farm vehicle and also just like school program vehicle. And we also bought, with the funding, um, a new bike, which you can see has this like bionic assist, that gray thing on the frame. Um, and so that uh, is an e-assist, and so it adds extra power um, an electric assist and then we also bought the trailer so that would be a load of produce and market supplies that James who's the tall man in the picture um, biked to the market and the students were able to set up the market that way too so we raised enough money for both of those things through our crowdfunding campaign so if you're thinking about doing crowdfunding um, for your program, there's a few key questions that you want to think about before you do it, and these are some of the questions that we'll go through. Um, but that would be, what are you raising money for? Um, what platform will you use? And how are you going to communicate with the people that are going to give you money? So those are really important things that you should spend a good chunk of time on before you ever start a crowdfunding campaign. So what will you raise the money for? Um, in our experience, people really liked that it was something tangible that we were raising money for like a thing. <laughs> and they could see a picture of the thing, and they could look up the market value of the thing, and they knew that we were asking for something that had like a clear cost. Um, and it also had a clear need, because it was timely, we needed it, our market started in June. Um, it was necessary, like we literally can't get to the market <laughs> unless you help us, which was a good position to be in. And it also had a really clear cost. So when people looked at how much money we were asking for, they could look up, the cost of a van and say, hey, that makes sense. This is a reasonable thing that they're asking me to contribute to. Um, on that same line, um, in our experience, it was a good idea to avoid fundraising for operating costs. Um, so even though we said, hey, we're fundraising for a van, a few people came back and said, like, how much does that van cost? Um, where's the money going? And people are hesitant to contribute to just like an ongoing core cost. So people really didn't want to pay for like our rent or our phone bill or those types of things because there's kind of a culture of thinking that the organization is responsible for being able to pay for those costs. Um, so it helped also in this situation that it was something that was kind of out of our control. Like it was an unforeseen circumstance that we lost the van rather than we lost the van because we couldn't manage our money or something like that. I think that that would sort of paint a different picture of when you're asking people for funding. What's next? Okay, so then what are you gonna raise money for? Um, you still wanna think too about your audience. So we knew that a lot of the people who might think about contributing to us probably were from Toronto. Um, they were people who live in cities. They were probably interested in youth work, but also are interested in environmental projects. And so to say that we were getting a van was necessary and important, but we realized we could also capture a whole other audience of people if we added a bike, um, because then all, everyone who's really into cycling <laughs> was retweeting and sharing and donating, whereas if we said we're just getting a van, they might not have been so inspired to donate money. Um, and so we got a whole other audience that sort of increased our reach. So you want to think about what you're asking people to pay for and what those people are interested in and if you can kind of tweak it so that it suits their interests and you still get what you need. Um, that's a great leverage. In terms of the platform, so this is like um, what actual website are you going to use? Um, I would spend a lot of time 
just looking at the websites and poking around um, and make some charts about how much each platform will cost. So for example, some um, some platforms will automatically take a fee and some don't. So Indiegogo took a fee. Um, they took a percentage of all of our donations, whereas some other platforms like YouCaring, they don't take a fee, but they do provide a little box for the person making the donation to opt to pay a bit of money to you caring to help maintain the service. Um, some of them have an established network. So Indiegogo has like people who love Indiegogo and they cruise around the Indiegogo site <laughs> and they look for new projects and they check out all the projects that are on the homepage. Some of them don't have an established network. So you just have to think about whether that's something that's going to be important to your project. Um, and then it's really important that you make note of what the fee is going to be and then factor that cost into what you're asking for. So for example, if the van costs $15,000, um, we could crowdfund for $15,000, but then we have to pay 5% of that $15,000, so we don't have enough for the van that we want. So when you come up with your total ask, you want to do the $15,000 plus factor in that you're going to have to pay a 5% fee, so you actually need to ask for something more like 15700 or 16000 so that you're paying for those costs um, within your total ask so that you're not short at the end and realize like, oh. Because it also sucks if people donate for a thing and then you end up not being able to get the thing. Right, so you really have to deliver on the thing. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Um, what do we got? Oh, yeah. Here's proof that we did our research. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, like, um, we had to think through if we were to get um, a bike uh, and a vehicle, all of those things together would come to 21000 But if we use the Indiegogo and they take 9% or they take 4%, so for example, um, what they're talking about there is if you reach your goal, um, they take 4%, but if you don't reach your goal, they take 9%. So you have to factor in like what happens if you come just shy of your goal and they're actually taking 9% instead of 4%, then you want to up again the total amount that you're asking for so that you get enough. Um, some of them take a third-party credit card processing fee, which Indiegogo did. So again, you want to factor in the fact that you're going to have to pay a processing fee into your total ask so that you're not out that money at the end, that you have enough to actually pay for it. So I would also recommend um, look up people who have done similar projects like you and talk to them and ask them which platform they used, what was good about it, what wasn't good about it. Um, and like I think the important thing is just like do tons of research before you start. Because that'll probably make the process easier when you're in the middle of it. Yeah, way easier. Um, yeah, so again, with some platforms, um, will take no cut at all if you reach your goal, or they take a smaller cut if you reach your goal. So what you do have to do is plan for what happens if you don't reach your goal, and they take a larger fee, then you need to ask for a larger total amount. Um, but you also have to consider, and we kind of chatted about this, but what are you going to do with all the money if you don't reach your goal? So say um, you need $12,000 for a van, and all you get is $4,000. Um, are you going to get a $4,000 vehicle, or are you going to spend that $4,000 on something else? Because people most likely will be mad <laughs> if they don't clearly understand that the money will be used for something else. <coughs> so your options are either to return donations because you're not going to get up to your goal, um, or to keep them and pay for something else or something of lesser value. But I think the important lesson is make sure that people know before they donate what happens if you don't reach your goal? So on your campaign website, you can say, hey, we're going, we're aiming for 15000 If we get less than that, we'll just buy a more affordable vehicle or we'll use the money for our programming costs or something. People just want to be informed so that they don't feel like they paid for a van and then you used it for something else. Did it help having the bike and the van separately? Because then let's say you didn't reach the total target, you'd still buy the name of the bike. Yeah. Maybe not get the yeah, you yeah. probably could have. Yeah. yeah, we could have said something like that for sure. And I think it is more like people crowdfund, like for example, they crowdfund to make their their documentary film. And they literally cannot make that film if their goal is a hundred thousand and they make six thousand. Mm -hmm. Like you just can't do it. You can't make like a crappier version. <laughs> it's gonna be really bad, yeah. right? Yeah. And so in that case, like you should probably just give the six thousand dollars back. 
Whereas if you're a nonprofit or if you're working in a youth program, 6,000 is still going to go pretty far. But the lesson is just like make sure that people know if we don't reach our goal, it's going to go to this or we're going to do this with the money. So just so they don't feel like you, I don't know, weren't being very clear. Look, there's Callie selling potatoes. <laughs> That's nice. All right. So, again, you want to do a lot of um, prep work. So before we even launch the campaign, um, we prepared a lot of photos for our campaign that already had, like, a tagline and had the website and had our Twitter handle. I'm sure Sufian has some some feedback on these images. Mm -hmm. But the idea was um, make, make all of these before you start so that they were just, like, that we could just schedule them to go up and you didn't even really have to think about it. Um, and then we also reached out to people th through email and, and send them like a sample tweet and a photo um, and be like, hey, can you tweet these exact words? <laughs> like just copy and paste this and here's a photo of you supporting us. Can you tweet it? Um, so for example, here's um, one of the restaurants that was buying food from us. So they're the Hogtown Cure. They've since changed their name to I think just The Cure, which is cooler. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess. Um, but we were like, hey, can you tweet this thing about how you support our work? And they probably never would have done it if we didn't make it so easy. But we made it so easy. And then on their restaurant page, they got like 100 likes and all of these shares. So you're, you're using all their networks too, which is nice. Um, and then you also want to think about how to make the content different throughout the whole campaign. So you're not just like, hey, donate to our campaign. Hey, donate to like same image, same thing, but we're like, hey, look at these restaurants, or like, hey, look at these cool things. Yeah. And, and that sounds cool, because there's already all these restaurant partners, and I'm assuming people who visit the farmer's market. Yeah. So you can really capitalize on having different kinds of content throughout the, the campaign. Yeah. These platforms will probably also throttle your post reach if you're just using the same message over and over. What does that mean, throttle your post so reach? You, the first time you post it, you might get some reach, mm -hmm. but then if you just paste the same message again the second time, they'll kind of scale it back and not let it go to It won't go people. as far? Yeah. Gotcha. Um, the other thing we did is we made a video. Um, so this is part of doing the preparation. <laughs> um, so a few notes about the video is consider investing in a good one, like pay someone to do it. We were pretty lucky in that um, we know a videographer who did it for literally a meatball sandwich is what he charged us. <laughs> um, so he did it as a favor, but um, he's worked on other crowdfunding videos where and platforms. So, for example, he did one where um, for a radio program, and they paid $6,000 for their video, which sounds like a lot, but they made $200,000 on their crowdfunding campaign because people were sharing the video, and, like, it got the message out a lot quicker. So... Consider actually having a really good video because it's probably a pretty wise investment. Um, you want to keep it short, so under two minutes is good. Um, you want it to have like a beginning and a middle and an end and not just be like, uh, of, I don't know. A bunch of found footage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice to have a like, hey, this is us. This is what we need. This is how you can do it, like kind of this a thing. This is what will help us accomplish. Yeah, this is what we're going to get out of it, that kind of a thing. Um, and then you also just want to give that sense, as Sufian said, like, this is what it's going to do. Like, why does this matter? So um, I'll, we're going to show you the link to our crowdfunding campaign, and you can watch the video there. But we, like, focus on having close-ups of the students' faces, like, footage of the students working in the garden. It's, like, really beautiful. The setting's really nice. Like, it could have easily just been me in a room, like, talking with, like, a brick wall behind me. It might not have been that inspiring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah, really give a sense. I think like what you get from that video is the whole scope of the program and where the van kind of fit into the program. Yeah. And the the bridge you'd kind of build by supporting the campaign. Yeah. And then going back to the last slide, if you have a beautiful video like this, you can screen cap it and use different frames as content so you also right. have more stuff to share. So you get more out of the investment. Yeah. 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 There's so more smart. returns than just the one time you share that. So smart. Okay, yeah, so there's like a, a little ah, sample cool. of Marco's face, right? Don't you just want to hang out with that kid? Yeah. Happy kid with a garden tool? Yeah. Right? Anyways, we'll show you the website and you can look at it. <laughs> um, in terms of perks, so one of the things that's really fun about crowdfunding is usually when someone donates, 
they get to choose some type of perk or like benefit Ooh. or free gift or whatever. So a few things that you need to think about before you decide are consider the actual full cost of the perk. So if, if you're going to mail it, if it's going to take staff time to distribute it all, um, if you need to package it to ship it, like a postcard might be something that you already have, but you have to pay for postage on each one. And if you're going to give a postcard for every $2 donation, maybe that's not a good investment, right? Um, so one thing we tried to do is get really creative with perks that don't cost anything. Um, so like that image on the right, one of our staff is a, a collage artist. Um, and she made like a, just a fun collage about gardening. Um, and we made it the right dimensions um, with a couple different options to be a digital download for like a computer desktop. Yeah. So it cost us literally nothing. Yeah. Um, we could just email it to people. Um, they felt like they got a reward. They got a nice original thing. Um, another one we did was like a digital download of a coloring sheet. So we didn't have to mail anything. Like there was no... Um, cost in that sense, but people still felt like they got something. Um, and actually our most popular perk was one that we just made up called Grow a Row, um, which was pick it and we'll grow a row of, of, <laughs> of a vegetable. Yeah. Um, but literally we just gave people options of things we were already going to grow. Yeah. Like we were like, here you get to choose between carrots, turnips, kale, hot peppers, and they'd be like, oh great, can you grow a row of carrots in my name? We'd be like, great, like we were already gonna, yeah. <laughs> we were already gonna grow the carrots. <laughs> but it, it just felt like, oh, I'm doing something, I'm contributing something, like it's nice. They We made a little image that said like, hey, we're growing a row in your name, and they could forward it like to their mom. Yeah. Like a lot of people were like, oh, and also it was Mother's Day at the time, so we did a like, um, we did a little like, hey, we you like grow a row of carrots, happy Mother's Day, and people would email it around, and you're like, all right, it costs us nothing yeah. in terms of additional costs, so, which is great. We thought that wasn't going to get a lot of traction, and that was the most popular the one. one. Yeah. People really liked it. And yeah, it was like, for no cost, you get this great emotional investment from the, the funder. Yeah. Yeah. And really people nice were picking day. like like you know a family member like had passed away and that was their favorite vegetable like it was really heartfelt yeah. for a lot of people yeah um, it's like a meaningful connection yeah right? so try and think of like what are those things that mean something to somebody and at the same time aren't causing like tons of extra costs to your thing to your thing um so again with perks so we didn't mail anything to anyone unless they spent fifty dollars <laughs> so we did mail like we had a one hundred dollar like sampler where they would get a t one of those tote bags and we filled it with some of our preserves, um, and we mailed it to like someone in Texas and someone in I don't know, Ontario, I want to say, but that's where we are. But like we, you know, we mailed it, but they spent a hundred dollars on it, so I don't mind paying for shipping for something that's like a hundred bucks. Um, also, be cautious with free perks that are quickly very annoying. So um, we saw a lot of campaigns that were like the free perk was like a shout out on Twitter, and then your social media account for the whole campaign just becomes like a bunch of repetitive thank yeah. thank yous that people just want to mute or unfollow you for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and also they don't really mean that much to like the person who donated, so um, that were like uh, annoying, we really wanted to avoid. And then also um, put a few like big ticket items on there because we, we did $750 to like put your name on the bike and two thousand five hundred dollars to put your name on the van um, and we also did um, for five hundred dollars <coughs> you could um, uh, name the hot sauce whatever oh, yeah. you wanted and then we put your face on the hot sauce like we were gonna make hot sauce anyways like yeah. um, but uh, people paid it once it's an option but if your highest option is only 50 bucks they're only gonna give you 50 bucks so if you give a few big ticket ones, you will get like a few big fish who are like, yeah. And there's kind of no harm in having these options, right? Because if yeah. someone buys it, no harm done. Yeah. But if they do, yay. Then you get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else we got? Oh, perks. Hot sauce. So um, one thing we realized was um, adding a perk like halfway through or each week we added like a new one, it gave you a new reason to update everybody with something that was like interesting and wasn't just, um, 
hey everyone, have you donated yet? <laughs> like it was like, oh, exciting update. Um, our like canned beets are back in stock. Um, and the other one was restocking. So we like, for example, we said there was 10 tote bags available and they sold out. And then we feel like, great news everyone, we restocked the tote bags. When like, in reality we had like 100 tote bags. But it just meant that we could be like, it, it created a sense of demand, it created like a, a nice reason to communicate with people to be like, oh, it's going so well, we had to restock something. Um, so you can also, as you plan your like communications around um, just like tweets and pictures, that also you can plan to have like updates on perks, which is fun. Sounds really cool. And then it's important, I'm guessing, to have all those things prepared far beforehand. Yeah. Because let's say there were only 10 tote bags and you can't offer this. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah, so pre planning. Yeah. And the, the running out of tote bags and restocking was also just realizing that we were like, oh, we put the wrong number down. <laughs> <laughs> like that wasn't strategic. <laughs> but once we did it, we realized ah. like when you put up a new perk, it updates everyone who already donated. And then you send a like, oh, have you shared it yet? Yeah. Like, you know, kind of thing. So instead of just being like, hey, it's me again, <laughs> I'm here to bother you. Um, another thing you can do is um, a lot of platforms will give you a referral link. So Indiegogo lets you do this in other ones too. Um, so that uh, like if Callie went online as Callie, she could email the link to her friends and family. And if they click through that link, Indiegogo knows that the referrer was Callie. So we can kind of track like who's actually sending people to the site. Um, and so one thing we did is we ran a contest. Jack Johnson picked us as a charity. Um, and he gave us two tickets for our staff to go after we were tabling at one of his concerts. And so instead we said whoever had the most referrals got these tickets. So that was kind of a motivator to get people who usually might think about emailing it, but then they don't, to say like, oh, you know, donate to this campaign and I'll get to go see my favorite musician. Yay. Look, there he is, holding a picture of the rooftop. Yay. There he is. So you can try and think of just different ways to get people to share it. Um, saying thank you is actually a lot of work, and you should plan to do it um, and put it into your schedule. Like, crowdfunding is actually a lot of work. <laughs> um, so after every donation that came through, we had a personalized email. So it was like a form email that said, like, hey, thanks so much. But we would, like, change their name, change the perk, like, add a little something if we knew who they were. Um, so it was, like each person checking them off the list to make sure we sent an email. Um, and that, that email always said thanks, and then it always included an ask that they share it with their friends and family with a link where it's like already written out. Um, and then we also realized that we could um, start making like shareable images. So the one on the right with the van is like an Instagram sized one, I think. Mm -hmm, square. Uh, yeah, square. <laughs> and the one on the left is like a Twitter sized one yeah. where you don't have to click on it. Like it is just the size of the initial like display um, to say like, hey, I supported, you should too. So we started making those and sending them out with the thank you. So it made it really easy for people to say, oh, look, I did this, you should do it too. Okay. Tax receipts. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so things you should know about tax receipts is uh, if you are a charity and people are donating to your crowdfunding campaign, you can issue a tax receipt for the amount of their donation minus the value of the perk that they chose. So for example, we had a $100 donation and you could get a fill your bag with veggies perk. So you would get a tote bag and you would come to the farmer's market and put vegetables in your tote bag. So if they're giving us $100, we would subtract the value of the tote bag, which is $15, and then subtract the value of the produce, which is $25. So their tax receipt is actually only for $60, not $100. Um, so it does mean if you have 20 different perks, you have to know what is the market value of all of those perks. Um, and then you have to keep track of who, how much did that person donate, because they could choose $100, fill your bag, but they usually have the option, too, to add an extra $20, or they could pay $150. So you do have to, like, it's really crossing off the list of, like, every donation to making sure you have the tax receipt value correct. Um, if they donate with no perk, so they're just giving you $100, then the tax receipt is just for $100 because they didn't get anything in exchange. Um, and one thing that we learned, because we did it the wrong way, is just make sure that that's really clear on your um, campaign somewhere. Like, 
in the words down below, like um, you do get a tax receipt or you get a partial tax receipt minus the cost of your perk, just so people know. The other thing we realized is we were like, oh, we, we're not mailing any of these perks, so we don't have to make people's mailing addresses mandatory because we're not mailing them anything, but then realize that for a tax receipt, you need people's mailing address. <laughs> so then we had to follow up with every individual person and be like, do you want a tax receipt? Please send us your mailing address. And then they don't, and then you follow up again. Like, it's just a lot of work. So um, make sure that you ask for their mailing address at the beginning. And they can opt out of it if they don't want a tax receipt, but at least you don't have to follow up. Yeah, that probably saves some time. Oh my gosh, so much time. <laughs> so many emails. Um, so yeah, if we haven't hit this home yet, it's definitely like a hustle. Um, one thing we realized is um, it sounds like you put this thing out into the world and then people just give you money and, and the internet just spoils you and <laughs> showers you with gifts. Um, but we realized that the majority of the donations came from referrals from our coworkers and our community partners and our friends and our market shoppers. And so the majority of the, don the donations came from asking people that we know to donate and asking them and bothering them and reminding them and putting up fun pictures and things like that. So you just have to make sure that if you're doing a month long crowdfunding campaign, you have people that can like work on it for the month. Cause it is actually quite a bit of just like coming up with new ideas and new content and hustling. Definitely. So what I can show you, I think this is going to come, oh yeah, they're here too. Hey everyone. <laughs> um, what I'll show you now is, um, oh sorry, the website, um, what the Indiegogo uh, website looks like um, when you are using Sorry, I have to get to it. I think you're just looking at that right now. Um, when you're using it from the back. Okay, so you can see that there. So when I'm logged in as the owner of a campaign, so it's school grown, um, help us get to the farmer's market. So some things that you can see um, are that we raised uh, 20000 um, and $200 total. So we actually went over our goal um, by 100 we were at 103%, so we went over by a little bit, which is great. Um, this shows you when the donations actually came in. So as you can see, when you, I think the first couple days there, like the $50, um, yeah, that first 50 was just me being like, does this work? <laughs> Test it. <laughs> and then once we actually started putting it out into the world, um, we started getting more donations. So it does take a while. Um, one thing to know is just like there are like valleys, right? So you have a good day where you're like, oh, two thousand dollars, like this is incredible. And the next day, <laughs> people are like, yeah, that's fine. And then they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. So this is when you need to be able to say like, check out our video, look at these cool pictures, like, hey, new person, have you heard about this thing? Like, so just to know that it really does like on these days we made what. $25, whereas this day, we made $3,000. So it is good to know that it, it it's kind of up and down, and that's why it's good to have a plan um, for how you capture people's interest, you know, in week two, for example. Um, you can also see, what else did I want to show you? Okay, so here's the refer kind of thing. So this is where you could see um, people who logged on and had an Indiegogo account. Um, so these are like Robin, she was in the lead, oh, yeah. right? Um, but you, this is how you could track people. So if you wanted to do a referral campaign or something like that, um, and then you can see how many people they got. So all of that was because people had emailed their friends. Um, it says that we got a lot of money from the U S but that is mainly just because that money came through PayPal, um, and not actually because the people were located in America. Um, but it does give you a lot of, as you can see, cool statistics. Um, it also gives you some information on perks and helps you manage those perks. Um, so you can see some of our perks. Um, you can see the number sold, um, the amount of that perk, and then the total that was raised. So what would be a good example? Like this Grow Row one that I was talking about, we actually sold 52 of those. 
Um, and that was literally just like, we're going to garden anyways. <laughs> um, allow us to garden with you. Um, a market tote bag, we sold 44 of those. You can feature a perk. So often we would just like feature uh, the higher, like a slightly higher price point one up top. Um, so that the first one people see wasn't the cheapest one, but actually like a different one. Um, yeah, like reserve your preserve. That perk was literally just name the chutney and we'll put your face on it. And someone paid $500 and someone paid $500 for the hot sauce too, right? Um, and then we also did get um, quite a few people who would donate and choose no perk at all because they just were going to donate and that was that. Um, this gives you a good sense of the actual cost. So um, in terms of the funds, like uh, that's people pay paying through PayPal versus paying through um, a debit or credit card. Um, the Indiegogo fees that they took was um, uh, $1,600. Um, but then because we met our uh, target goal in the end, they gave us a refund. So you can see that like it actually costs quite a lot <laughs> um, to use a platform like Indiegogo. And I would say that almost all of our referrals came from people that we knew and not from the Indiegogo website. And so I don't think that it was necessarily worth it. Um, and we could have used a platform that didn't take um, so much money in our experience. But it was nice to try it. And this is what, um, so this is the kind of thing that you need to set up before you start, where you're coming up with all your text. Um, you can see we had 229 people um, donate, which is pretty great. Um, the video is like front and center. You can also send updates, um, which is communicating with everyone who had donated to you. So um, we'll have this link up and you can kind of poke around and see like, how do you describe your work? How do you get people excited? Linking to people, all that kind of stuff. Um, so then we also wanted um, Sifian to talk about um, more in-depth about like social media and things like that because he's a genius, I tell you. Oh, a few things. So I think we've kind of hit a lot of the points about <laughs> what's important and what's not important. Do you want the slides again? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. The... I'll grab those. And I think it's important to stress again what Katie was mentioning about most of the donations are going to come from people you know or people who know the people you know. Um, and then some will come from online. So, so where social comes in handy is kind of providing that continued momentum throughout the campaign. Uh, like we were talking about the peaks and valleys. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about how that goes. But uh, pre-campaign, again, when you're planning all this stuff, uh, what your perks are gonna be, what your video looks like, what images you're gonna use, really be aware of where you are right now. If you have like 10 Twitter followers, don't spend a lot of time thinking about what you're going to do with Twitter. Um, if you have an organizational account, think about, do I want to create a different account specifically for the campaign, or do I want to just use the organizational account? And if you do use an organizational account, be really aware of how much content is going to be directly related to the campaign. Because if your Twitter account just becomes a bunch of thank yous, that could alienate some of your core audience, and that's a, I don't, don't, that's probably not a good outcome. Um, and pick your platforms based on your target audience. Um, so this is, again, where thinking about your audience comes in handy. If most of the people who you have an idea that are going to donate are on Instagram, think about creating all your content or a lot more of your content for that platform. Um, if they're on Twitter, think about all your sample posts, where are those going to end up, um, and which one you should work the most on. Um, pick a hashtag. Use it in posts where possible. Um, we saw quite a few during all the sample images. In, in the slide deck, so think about that, make them fun. And the important part about having those hashtags also is um, instead of just the financial peaks and valleys we saw earlier, the hashtag can help you track how far you're getting in terms of reach and if it's who's sharing that hashtag and all the links you use to push people to your campaign page, uh, try to use a link tracker for those. So Bitly or Alley, those are all free. And what those will do is show, again, with referrals, is it just you that's sharing this link? Are people who you've sent this link to, are they sharing it? How many people are clicking on it? How often are they clicking on it? And if you use a consistent link shortener during the campaign, you can also kind of find out which post is working and which posts are not working. Uh, sample tweets are there. Uh, yeah, Katie already mentioned this. Yeah, this is well beforehand. Really think about <laughs> who you're already in contact with. 
people you know, your friends, uh, partners, organizations, uh, in this case, farmers markets, all the restaurants you're working with, those people know a lot of people. Um, and it's really important to get to those people too. Yeah? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Right, so link tracker there. So yeah, kind of looking at this map, if you have a link tracker set up, you can see maybe the posts here weren't as engaging as the posts here, which is why this is a bigger blip. Mm -hmm. uh, think about what days of the week you're posting this stuff on. If, if something big happens in the news, people will probably not look at your posts that much. So really being aware of when you're posting, uh, which platforms, and what your messaging is. Uh, and then during the campaign, uh, make Ask somewhat. Um, don't just make it a bunch of repetitive posts about uh, fund our thing. Uh, think about you have all these different posts where you can frame what problem your posts are going to solve, and then you can make an ask once you've established that problem. And this ties into the video, having a really clear, concise, uh, engaging, short piece of content that can get people on your, on your side. Uh, don't annoy your regular audience. Yeah, I mentioned this a little bit. Um, if you, if, again, if you're going to use uh, your main organizational account, uh, don't just flood it with purely uh, fundraising content. Share milestones during the campaign, and this comes into gratitude. And it's, again, another natural point of re-engaging with people. Uh, this is really great. I heard about the perks just now. Um, if Yeah, if you're going to restock a perk, that's more exciting than, like, we were halfway there. Halfway there is great, and it can get a second boost, but that's probably another actionable item, getting people to, to get another perk. Uh, the other thing you can do during a campaign, or and you probably have to plan for this before, depending on how much capacity you have trying to pitch it to media, uh, if, if you can orient the problem you're going to solve in a meaningful story or narrative, you might be able to get some media hits, uh, but it's time sensitive and doesn't guarantee results. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yep. Okay. Next one. Yeah. Post campaign. Uh, it's always nice to be grateful of what you've done. Um, one of the simple ideas is your words can be a content strategy. And so going back to the not just filling it with a bunch of thank yous that are kind of boring. Um, maybe if the grow a row, this this could be months later. But if that row starts growing, you can just snap a picture of it and kind of tag it. That takes like two minutes. Um, if you want to do something more tailored, that'll take longer. But thinking of natural ways in which what you've done or managed to accomplish can be turned into a content strategy. That can be fun. Yeah, try turning all your perks into things you can share, again, that are useful rather than just thank you. Yeah. Cool. And one thing I jotted down during the thing, uh, mm -hmm. when you're picking your platform, I uh, also think if it's optimized for mobile. I think most of them are now. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of people just use the internet on their phone. On their phone. Yeah. So try not to lose those people out. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool. Um, I don't think we saw any questions come through. But if you're watching this later, um, or if you think of something later, you can send us an email um, or send us a tweet, and we'll get back to you. And then also, um, on our website, by the end of this week, we're going to join me, friends. <laughs> by the end of this week, um, we're going to have the four webinars that we did. So this is the fourth one in a series. Um, and then uh, we'll also have a few like resources. Like we have a crowdfunding handout thing with all the, the details and stuff that we'll get up on the website by the end of this week so that you can download and read and share. Um, and we're always up to chat. So you can send us an email. Hooray. Hooray. That's go, it. Go crowdfund now. Yeah. Yay. Go get your money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you.